<laughs> We're currently live at Panthera headquarters in New York, and I'm Allison Devlin, a Jaguar biologist working with Panthera and PhD candidate. Joining me today are Dr. Alan Rabinowitz, chief scientist at Panthera. He has spearheaded studies with jaguars in Central America, and his brainchild is the Jaguar Corridor Initiative. He's also endeavoring on the jaguar journey, which is taking him from Central America through South America. Also here as a special guest is Steve Winter. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Steve is a National Geographic photographer. He's been working with Nat Geo for over 26 years, and he's been specializing in wildlife and specifically in big cats. If anyone today has been able to catch the recent documentary that premiered on Nat Geo Wild, um, it was a documentary called Jaguar vs. Croc. Um, that was Steve's work in the Pantanal. And he also has an article in the December 2017 issue of National Geographic called Shrinking Kingdom of the Jaguar. So both Alan and Steve recently returned from the Pantanal, and they're here today to talk about everything Jaguar. So we're looking forward to answering your questions. and. We will, I suppose, work. Give us them. questions <laughs> if you like Jaguars and yeah. find out more. <laughs> so with us, we are also talking about not only features with National Geographic, but past experiences. This is something that Steve has been traveling to the Pantanal, observing Jaguar behavior over many years. Alan has also been studying Jaguars for many, many years and is one of or is the world's leading researcher on jaguar ecology and jaguar behavior. So we have a lot of information that we can cover with jaguars, personal experiences, advice for getting into this field and line of work. So anything that you're able to... This ask, is how we met on the that's first right. National Geographic story. Steve and I, I cold called called <laughs> cold called Alan. True, and right asked right. you whether you thought it would be possible to do the first ever story on Jaguars. Sure. And you said yes. That's how I got involved in all this, was just calling you at the wrong zoo. Steve and I have worked together many, many years. But what's, what, what so stood out in my relationship with Steve from the earliest day was that I was a scientist. He was a photographer but he was the first photographer I had ever met who actually wanted to make sure that his photography had meaning in the conservation world. He had little interest in, in taking phenomenal pictures just for their own sake, which he has always done. But he wanted to make sure that anything he did, and he remains this way to this day, which is why I admire him so much, Anything he does has a connection to the world of conservation and makes a real impact. If more people did that in different fields, then we would be much further ahead in saving big cats and other wildlife than we are now. A lot of people ask me this question about uh, why did you get involved in conservation? And it was like, I didn't know any better. <laughs> You, you would be both. Not only did I not know any better, I just figured, why would you spend so much time working on an animal without trying to be sure that it was saved and protected afterwards? But I had no background in wildlife at all. Um, and so from the beginning, I just figured that that's what you were supposed to do. But I was a photojournalist, and it helps to tell the story. you got to tell the story of the animals, and that includes the science the people and uh, the situation of the animal and its landscape and ecosystem. You're an observer, though, too. You, you observe, if people would have asked me, look, I can't talk to you. Who can I next go to to speak, find out really about what happens with jaguars? I wouldn't send them to another scientist. I'd send them to you. Because you have, you, you have spent so many hours alone with these cats, not just jaguars, but others, but you observe. That's what I always really admired about you. You wouldn't just be looking at the cat as a subject. You, you would be look, looking at it as part of the environment and figuring out how your subject could save things. Mm -hmm. So we have our first question in from Lisa. Yay. And this is a question uh, directed for Alan. 
Alan. Um, how many jaguars are left in the wild? That's that. That's always the question. I hope I won't get. Yeah. <laughs> um, because there, there, there's a good reason for a good story behind my answer, which is we really don't know. Now, having said that, the reason for us not knowing is a good one. It's much easier. It's very hard counting cats, counting big cats in the wild, any of them, snow leopards, lions, tigers. But you can best count them when there are very few left, unfortunately. One of the reasons, now the jaguar is a threatened species, and we really have to be, be careful about its decline. However, it's doing better than the other big cats out there. While I cannot give you an exact number, and I'm not sure we ever could because there are enough left from Mexico to Argentina to where it would be a moving target and it would take so long to get that number. What we can tell you is that they're doing better than they have been in many parts of their range, but they're also doing worse than they have been in some other key areas of the, their range. And there are several tens of thousands of jaguars left. I can't tell you if there's 100,000 jaguars out there or 20,000 jaguars out there, but, but there's somewhere in between. So dovetailing into that, the next question is, what are the main obstacles you're facing with the Jaguar Corridor all throughout the Central and South American parts of the initiative? And how far along is this project? Well, the Jaguar Corridor, basically it was a concept Steve was with me on from the beginning. The, the Jaguar Corridor, we didn't even know, we didn't make the Jaguar Corridor. This is what's so beautiful about this. The Jaguar Corridor was created by the Jaguars without us as scientists even knowing it existed. We thought that we would have to spend a lot of time just trying to save some of the last remnant populations of jaguars scattered throughout their range. And in the process, we learned the scientists with new genetic techniques, new knowledge through Steve's work and others, that these jaguars were not just stationary animals just having their own little home ranges in one area, but that many of them were moving. The young ones were dispersing and they were moving out to other areas through the human landscape, which is something which we were able to determine genetically, but Steve and his photographs have, has been able to actually capture on camera how they would sneak through the human landscape under fences, through cattle pastures. The problem is that anything sneaking through the human landscape always faces humans. So we are dealing with loss of habitat, fragmentation. We're dealing with land use issues. Now jaguars can move through lots of things. They can move through cattle ranches and backyard gardens and coffee plantations and oil palm plantations but they can't easily move through six lane highways or major, major plantations, which are thousands of square kilometers in size. So what we are facing are people killing jaguars now. There seems to be a resurgence of killing of jaguars to their parts for the Chinese medicinal and spiritual trade. We're facing human population pressures, and we're facing human landscape pressures. But the Jaguar Corridor still exists, and with the help of people like Steve and myself, we are going to try to ensure that, that the Jaguar Corridor exists. So one of our viewers wants to know, Steve, you can start. Alan, I'm sure you also have some great stories to share. So for Steve, what was your best experience when observing and studying jaguars? Well, the best are tough because you can look at one of the first ones uh, where the first time I ever came face to face to a jaguar, which was over 20 years ago, or the ones we just did with Scarface down the Pantanal. I mean, uh, in the beginning, you could barely see a jaguar. Um, I started putting camera traps out on the first story, first ever National Geographic Jaguar story, and I started it 21 years ago uh, on it. You can barely see them, and now you can. 
down in the Pantanal because of tourism. So, you know, when I always want to see a mom and cubs. Well, now you can. And other animals, you go to Africa, you see a lion take down an impala or buffalo or something. You could never do that with jaguars, but now you can. I mean, you just have to wait a long time. So I think my last encounter and seeing the first ever kill after waiting for three weeks, October, August 18th. Um, so that was 18 days of being on the river. We saw Scarface step on a caiman and just see him power that thing. Alan always said they're like bodybuilders. He actually went underwater, came out with the Jaguar in his mouth and just went up the bank. It's probably one of the most incredible things I've ever seen in my life with a cat, not just with a jaguar, with any cat. Steve and I have very different experiences. I actually envy Steve, who has who has been able to watch jaguars and their behaviors more than I have. Steve has spent days and months, literally, waiting for and watching jaguar behavior behind his camera in order to get those get those photos. Much of my time has been spent on the move, always Jaguars ahead of me, tracking them, trying to find them, trying to maybe capture them and radio collar them in some cases. So my, my most outstanding experience hasn't been one where I was able to watch some incredible behavior, which I envy greatly because they're such secretive cats. But it's one where I learned a lot about them when I was tracking one particular large male in the jungles of Belize, and I was by myself, and I don't normally go in the jungle by myself, and I had just seen these tracks and taken off, and I was tracking it and tracking it thinking, no, I gotta go back to, to camp, maybe just around the next corner. And, and then I lost its tracks on the trail. And I thought, I'll try to go another half hour or so, and if I don't see it, I'll go back. And I'm traveling this trail, no more tracks, and I decide it's getting dark, and I stop and turn around to go back to camp, and there's the Jaguar in back of me. The Jaguar, had, it, it, it knew I was in back of it. Jaguars know what's going on. They're, they're very non-aggressive, the most non-aggressive of the large cats. It had circled around and had been following me for almost the last half hour. I had lost its tracks. And, and it was right there in back of me. It could have killed me in time. I was terrified and I was thrilled and I was in awe all at the same time. And I had a few moments, I didn't have a lot of time, but I had a few moments where, where I squatted and the Jaguar sat down and I was able to go eye to eye and watch it, being very afraid, thinking what's gonna happen next because I, I have no power here. But then the Jaguar just stood up and walked off into the bush. That was, that was one of the most amazing experiences I had with Jaguars and showed me inextricably how non-aggressive they are. They're just curious. A lot of people who say, well, a jaguar was following me and tracked me and almost killed me. Jaguars will kill you if they want to. When they're following you, they're curious. 100%, man. So the next question from one of our viewers, uh, Alan, I think you can also answer for this. Um, Steve, feel free to jump in after you too. Um, if ecotourism is good for jaguars, what place is in most need for ecotourism? You know, I'm going to have Steve talk about that first, because Steve has had a lot of experience trying to track these places down. Well, when I, I first was invited to a place that I had to look up on a map, the Pantanal, many years ago, I went down there and people thought I was crazy. They said, ah, we're, we just fish here. Yeah. You know, yeah, we see jaguars. Well, now that same area... I love things like this. What I'm going to say next is Fernando that works for Panthera did a study where it showed how the economic importance of these cats. A lot of people go, cats should be important whether they're worth money or not. But you're taking a place where people would commonly kill jaguars. Alan funded that first GPS sack collared study 
which showed what 1% of cattle deaths could be attributed to Jaguars. Now that place is involved in ecotourism where each Jaguar is worth $108,000 a year in ecotourism income. And that means those animals are protected because look at the local communities. Every, all those local families have some connection economically to those cats. They drive the boats, they drive the vehicles that come from, you know, where the people land at the airport, they work in the lodges. That whole economy is wrapped around the Jaguar. We're in the past, a rancher would go, the Jaguar killed my cow, and so they would uh, kill the Jaguar. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. And so you want to take something like this Jaguar ecotourism, uh, which is based literally on making money showing people Jaguars. It's a business proposition that helps save these animals and may be replicated in other locations. Uh, but this is unique because during the dry season, everything comes down to the river and you can actually see Jaguars. But it's been interesting because I, when I first was in the Pantanal also with Steve and in the earlier days, I thought, well, this is incredible, but it's not easily replicable because it's by a river and in the dry season, all the Jaguars come to the river. But, but you know, like anything, it's a matter of create, creativity. What we're finding, there have been places we've been in Mexico, in, the, in northern Mexico, the Sonoran Desert and the Sinaloan Desert, where people who own land with Jaguars are now hearing about people wanting, paying good money to come and see Jaguars or experience the possibility of even seeing a Jaguar. And they, they are building on their land because in dry season there, there is no water, no water at all. And they're building little, little ponds or water leaf facilities at key places, putting up tree stands, tree cabins, where people could go and sleep for several days or a day or a night. And they're seeing jaguars. It's not guaranteed. It's not quite as straightforward or, or as easy as it is in the Pantanal. But people can go and have that experience. We had part of our team visit this area. And they stayed only one night in the dry season. They didn't see the jaguar. But at 3 o'clock in the morning, they heard the jaguar growling in the forest nearby probably noting that these people were there possibly and didn't want to come in because jaguars are, are pretty secretive, but they could hear the vocalizations of the jaguar. And that, you do that, and that's an experience unlike any other in the world. So Natasha asks, what is being done to address jaguar-human conflict? Are there projects that seek to quickly compensate locals for cattle that are killed by jaguars in order to diminish the chances of retaliation? So part of the work that we've been doing at Panthera has been with human wildlife conflict, including jaguars and pumas. Um, throughout Latin America, we've engaged with over 50 pilot ranches, and we recently published a journal article detailing some of those preliminary findings. Some of the techniques that we've been using include putting up electric fencing so that if the predator tries to cross the fence, it'll get that shock and deter the predator from crossing the fence. We've also been talking with cattle ranchers about different management techniques. So in a seasonal environment like the Pantanal, you get a dry season and you get a rainy season with floods. If cattle are calving during that rainy season, the calves are vulnerable to predation. The jaguars have also moved inland more, away from those rivers, because of the distribution of water, the native prey, the wild prey species also move inland more. So if we're going to help cattle ranchers with long-term management, we can say if you concentrate calving to a specific season or a specific window of time, that'll help remove that vulnerability of calves born over a longer period of time. Um, we've also been helping set up night enclosures. So the cattle can graze in the pasture during the day, and at night they're all brought into an enclosure. And you can outfit that enclosure with night alarms, um, either with sound systems or lights, and you can also put electric fencing around that. This is something we're looking to scale up so that we can apply it based on certain variables that we would see at other cattle ranches. So we're doing some experiments, and we're starting with 
broader scale, larger scale experiments, especially within the Pantanal, with ranchers that have reached out to us and ranchers that are also interested in testing these experiments. And the goal is so that we, when we test these, we can get repeatable and quantifiable differences in the decreased predation over time. And that's something that we really want to help cattle ranchers coexist with jaguars. Compensation has been used in other areas, and that's something that you would need someone to go out and verify that the cow was killed by a jaguar, for example. Um, they have a set number of um, criteria that they would have to fit, and we have data sheets where we would fill out and assess those cattle carcasses. Um, but that is something where we would want something more sustainable where it would be cattle ranchers, we help set this system up and then they can incorporate it into their daily lives. And in a way, working ourselves out of a job in a sense so that it's helped create this infrastructure where they're living side by side with jaguars. As part of that, you also wanna make sure the wild prey are really um, healthy in the area. So yeah. those populations are very healthy because jaguars, tend to go for the native prey. Cattle are more or less easier targets, and if they're managed, um, I guess, with a lighter touch, they'll sometimes wander into areas that are higher risk. So if we can change those techniques, remove that risk for predation, jaguars will to kill their native prey species, and they'll still hunt those native prey. Um, we're also working with local communities, especially in the Pantanal, one of our flagship programs is the Joffrey Value School, which is based at Panthera's Joffrey Value, um, right in the heart of the Pantanal. And for ranchers and local community members that agree to not hunt jaguars, to coexist with jaguars, they get free access to elementary education. This is something where if families didn't have this access, they would have to split up so the children and the mothers would have to move to the cities and the fathers would stay behind working at the ranches. We also want to help provide health care in the area. This is something showing that investing in local communities, and this is something that both Ellen and Steve have talked at length about in other areas, and I'm sure they have more to add as well. Um, by doing that, you're building that infrastructure, you're helping to support this coexistence between people and wildlife, people and these really important People and jaguars, because it's all related back to it. I stayed on the ranch for two months when we did the Jaguars versus uh, the Jaguar film and the National Geographic story. And you see the kids coming every day, but at night, people come. People that do not know how to read and write, boatmen, cowboys, they come to learn how to read and write. And that's amazing because it's all under the umbrella of Jaguar conservation and Panthera, you know, built the schoolroom and all that. These guys are really proud of the fact that they are learning to read and write. It's great. And how far has it it's come from this isolated group of, you know, cowboys and, and uh, jaguars were a problem. So now jaguars are the most important animal there because it brings in some tourism. And now it also brings in education and the name of jaguar and conservation. So it's great. Yeah, absolutely. So Ryan asks, this is a question for both. A Bolivian guide told me pumas and jaguars tend to show up at different times on his camera tracks, never closer than within a few hours. What have you guys noticed? Thanks. Well, I'll go first, and then Steve can talk about his experience because he's had much with pumas and jaguars. When we have studied jaguars, and I personally studied them in Central America, that's exactly right, that pumas and jaguars overlap their territories completely. But what I found was that pumas were never in the exact same area when jaguars came into that area. Jaguars seemed to dominate. Jaguars chose where they wanted to go and when they wanted to be there. And when jaguars moved into an area, the puma tracks I'd be seeing along a trail would all of a sudden vanish and go into a different part of the study area. When the jaguars left that particular area or were in that area but not close by, as this person has been noting, the, the pumas would come in. These animals, these cats, have a very sophisticated means of communication. 
They can talk. They can communicate with each other just like we do. And there's a whole language there. And the Jaguars and the Pumas know where each other are, know when another is in the area, know if it's a male or female. There's a sophisticated uh, system of marking behavior with feces and with urine and with scrapes. So, yes, overall, what, what I found in the field is what you're talking about, ha having heard or seen it in Bolivia, to where jaguars and pumas live together, overlap, often occur in the same jungle or landscape, but they're never in the exact same area at the exact time. We've had actual cases of local people seeing a jaguar and a puma run into one another on a main road. And there's been some vocalizations, and inevitably the puma has gone off. Steve? I think the only thing I can add to that is to take it to other cats, because yes, that's true. I've, I've seen them both in the same area and both the same camera show. But think of Africa. You have lions, leopards, cheetahs together, and in Asia you have tigers and leopards together. So just make it so it feels good to you, you know, because you see those other animals in the same area and the same with jaguars and pumas. So it's uh, they live together. The lesser of the cats will be the ones that will stay out of the jaguar's way. Like uh, if we saw a leopard in tiger territory, you know that there's no tiger around, so we would move on. So, yeah. So Daniel asks, this is for Alan, how does the Panama Canal impact the corridor? That's a very good question. When, uh, when, when, when we first learned in, in 2000, 1999-2000, that the genetics were showing that there is indeed a jaguar corridor, that the jaguars are genetically connected from Mexico to Argentina, the, the first thought that popped into my head was what the hell do they do at the Panama Canal? So we went down one of our first trips when we started devising this Jaguar Corridor Initiative was to the Panama Canal. And there's areas not, not where the locks are and not where they're expanding the Panama Canal at those locks, but, but there are areas of the Panama Canal with jungle on both sides, which come right up to, to the banks. And you or I could swim, a decent swimmer could swim across there. And the jaguar is more than a decent swimmer. It, it, it actually yeah. is an excellent swimmer and can swim much further than the width of the Panama Canal in, in these areas. Also, as we started putting up cat, now, having said this, so I learned immediately that, wow, the jaguar could cross here. Now, of course, local people always know much more than, than we do usually. So when we talked to the local people, local people told us, sure, we see Jaguar tracks coming right up to, to, to the bank of one side of the Panama Canal, and often we'll find Jaguar tracks, which we think are the same Jaguar, coming out from the other side of the Panama Canal. There's an island in the bay, in one of the large bay areas, Gatun Bay, where the Smithsonian Institute has a facility in the Panama Canal. When they started putting up camera traps, they had never had a jaguar on that island to their knowledge, although they, I believe that they have. But, but they've never known of jaguars being on that island since the Panama Canal was flooded and it, be, and it became an island. Once they put up camera traps, they actually all of a sudden, just in one two week period, photographed a jaguar. It was there. And, and then it was gone. Now, I can't say it crossed. It might have gone back. But jaguars do swim out, and we know we don't have to see them. The genetic tools are telling us that occasionally there's one good swimmer, one tough jaguar, one jaguar that just has to get away from its parents that swims the Panama Canal and gets over to the other side. Now, when they started the new construction on the Panama Canal and started expanding it, that was a big worry to me and to, to us studying jaguars. Fortunately, 
most of the construction is in the locks area, in the in the area where the locks are. There, there is no new construction plan, to my knowledge, at this point, where the Jaguars are mostly crossing the Panama Canal. If there ever becomes that situation, and we're monitoring it all the time, we would try to intercede because it doesn't have to be that way. So this, this is a good question, and, and it's been Jaguar swim. Well, one of the things Steve's yeah. work and photographs have, have documented is Jaguars are almost short of being aquatic in certain areas. Yeah. Steve, is, Steve has documented this way before anybody ever knew it, just how much they feed. I didn't actually think Jaguars, I knew they swam well. I didn't think they actually made kills in the water, but they do. Steve mm -hmm. has documented that. So Jaguars are unbelievable at being, being able to overcome obstacles which humans are great at throwing in their way. So the key is, how do we, we keep the human obstacles down to a minimum to where Jaguars can keep on going? Because they will keep on trying, just like a person. You, 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 you put up a fence and a Jaguar will try to climb it. You build a dam and a Jaguar will try to swim it. You build a road and a Jaguar will wait by the side of the road, literally, because we know this until there's no cars coming and, and they'll cross it. but they can only take so much so the key is trying to moderate human development with what these jaguars can still do and survive if you're just joining us we're live at Pantheras headquarters in new york city and we're here with dr alan rabinowitz chief scientist at panthera and steve winter <laughs> national geographic photographer <laughs> And the next question that we have is from Louise, and he asks, and this can be for Steve, um, have you observed any impact of global climate change upon Jaguar populations? Uh, not necessarily, uh, uh, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could look at uh, climate change in regards to like tigers in the Sunderbunds because there's more water coming up. Uh, I think weather patterns have changed dramatically um, all around the world. Uh, and I just know since I've been working at Nat Geo, we used to ask people, hey, when's a good time of year to go down here or to do this? And now there is no good time or is, there's no guarantee. When we're in the Pantanal, it's usually for us in the United States, 110, 115 degrees. We had days where I had every coat that I brought with me on, and I was still cold um, during this time. So patterns change. It changes the behavior of the animals also. But um, I'm sure they are. But from a layman's point of view, my it hasn't uh, changed. Actually, I see more jaguars. But that is because they're more accustomed to humans and as far as the weather patterns are the level of the water goes, uh, it's, you know, it changes year to year anyway, so. And I'd like to, to say, this is, uh, this is a very, very relevant question. We're getting this kind of question all the time for, for all the cats, which as Steve has indicated, climate change is even more of a factor when we think about what, what's happening with snow leopards and tigers and some other species. But here, here's the important part, the beauty of the jaguar corridor and part of its importance of why we need to maintain this connectivity of movement from, from Mexico to Argentina is because that corridor of movement is what mitigates climate change factors on the jaguar and on other wildlife. The key to surviving climate change is being able to move and shift patterns where you live now we know this how do we know it because the greatest climate change in recorded history and prehistory has been in an at a time called the pleistocene during the pleistocene we had 17 i mean climate change in the way we think about it is nothing compared to what happened then 17 glacial interglacial periods of climate change where 80% of the large mammals went extinct coming out of the Pleistocene. 
Jaguars and, and the other cats which are alive today, lions, tigers, snow leopards, clouded le leopards, boomers, they survived. And they survived because they were able to move, to shift their patterns through, well, then it wasn't even corridors, it was just, just major landscapes. The, the, the ability to move it is what helps species survive. Once species get fragmented, this is why we worry with species like tigers. Even though we save tigers, if, if we're only saving them in locked up fragments of forests in places like India, that's no better than a safari park or a large zoo. That could lead to extinction if major climatic changes happen. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I found from a layman's point of view again, is that I remember one year, about six, seven years ago, I went, hey, is there caiman poaching again? And the guy goes, we've never poached or eaten caiman here in the Pantanal. But what happened was they had less rain. That's a climate action. They had less rain. There was less fish. So there was less caiman. And then the jaguars had less food because there was less food. So you talk about climatic issues affecting big cats. It's, it's also, do they have food to eat? And it's all interconnected. It's just like right now, there's so much fish in the rivers of the Pantanal, so there are so many caiman, and then so many capybara because there was, there was a great year for water, so there's a lot of grass for the world's largest rodent and the second uh, food source for the jaguar. So that is the thing, like Alan says, they're able to move, but they have to have food, so they're gonna move where the food's at. And when the food's plentiful, you're going to have a, everything works. Everything works like clockwork. And that's going to change when climate changes or there's no rain or too much rain. So Alan, Kate asks, do you ever envis envisage seeing jaguars again in North America? Sure. Um, it's possible. It's actually more possible than I thought it was years ago. Ha having now visited during our journey of the jaguar, in fact, during its earliest stages, we went there. We went there again. I've been there. Steve has been there. He's put up cameras there. I, I, I went and visited Warner Glenn, the man who was the first person to actually take a picture of a jaguar in the United States. I went there to see what kind of habitat there is here, what kind of prey is actually available here. That's wild country. On, on the U.S.-Mexican border, is some very, very wild country, dry desert country, not great jaguar habitat. I always called it the jaguar equivalent of hell on earth. But it's, not so bad. But it's possible <laughs> for jaguars to live in this area as they have proven. Now, what we now know from better camera trapping and monitoring and, and data is that even when jaguars were extirpated from the United States, which to the best of our knowledge, last female jaguar was killed in 1963. But since, since jaguars have been extirpated, there has still been movement of jaguars from this population in Mexico, in, in the Mexican state of Sonora, northward into the United States, as if some jaguars are trying to disperse, not trying, they're dispersing into the United States. We know that. There have been jaguars coming into the U.S. However, since that time, there's been no record of, of breeding, of females, or, or of young. And what we, we, we do know biologically is that it's actually extremely difficult extremely difficult for a new population to be established just by dispersers because most of the dispersers are males. Females don't disperse very far. However, the nearest jaguar population, which is doing pretty well, is not that far from the United States. And, and, and it looks to be expanding. And, and if it expands northward a little more, those females may be able to get up across there. So without reintroduction, naturally, do I think that there's a chance that jaguars could re-inhabit? 
the southwestern United States? Yes, I, I think that there's a chance. That chance will be obliterated if, if we think we can build a wall that stops everything. But to be quite honest with you, you the jet places I've been and Steve has been, where Jaguars are coming across are just so rugged. I don't see any possibility of, of, of anybody building a wall there. And Jaguars could move into those areas. So is it possible? Yes. Are the chances good? No. No, chances are slim. But it's possible if we watch it and help it along and protect the Jaguars in Mexico. So for this next bill, did you have anything to add? No, well, yeah, I, there, there is prey, there's pumas, there's bears. I just took the, I, well, I didn't, the great people of University of Arizona uh, took down my traps in October, and uh, there's a lot of deer on there, and pumas, and people, and bears trashing my camera traps, but they're down there. Two, two jags came across about a year ago. Maybe following the scent one from another. We don't know where they're at now, though. So for this next question, um, Tristan asks, um, and this can start with Alan and then head over to Steve. Um, after the Pontanol, what are the main areas of Jaguar distribution and are locals in these areas also being educated as to the financial benefits of a healthy Jaguar population? That's a good question. There are many, there are many key areas. The Pontanol is just one of, of, of numerous key populations and landscapes geographically ranging from northern Argentina and into northern Mexico. I could name two dozen pl places where there are very important Jaguar populations. But the second part of your question is a very important one. Are the people being educated or being, being involved in the process? It's not always easy to educate them on the economic benefits of having Jaguars because there aren't always clear economic benefits. While we talk about ecotourism, it's like ecotourism anyplace else in the world, in Africa and Asia. Not every ranch can be an ecotourism endeavor. Not every person's house, which has Jaguars passing by it, you can all of a sudden start and make a lot of money from, from, from ecotourism. So you can't just say, to people, look, you, you could make tons of money from ecotourism. In fact, those are false promises, and people could be very disappointed about it. What we need to be educating them on, and we are, is the, is the interrelationships, which Steve has been talking about earlier, of jaguars with, with the natural world with which they live, which makes it this rich world in terms of rich biologically and rich culturally. Fortunately, I've never seen an area in Jaguar range where the people want all Jaguars extinguished. Most of the people, nearly all of the people, there are a few exceptions I've encountered, feel that Jaguars are, are a very important part of their cultural identity, of the cultural landscape, of their, of their heritage. But they don't want to have to sacrifice for their for their family and their children or because of jaguars. So it's more a case, as we were talking about earlier, of, of how you ed educate people on mitigating conflict so that jaguars are not actually hurting them economically. And then what they see is that if jaguars are not hurting them economically or, or they can mitigate that conflict, how having them in the, the environment regulates and balances the environment and the prey species and the, and the flora and fauna in a much greater way than they had previously understood before. I've been in areas where the jaguars have been wiped out and the local people or the indigenous people are actually very sad for that and would like jaguars back. And now it's too late in some areas. But they actually, I've never been in an area with Jaguars who says, this is horrible, I want them all gone. Just help me, how do I live with these Jaguars? But, but I have been in areas, as Steve has, where Jaguars have been wiped out, and people say, literally, I've had a, a, an indigenous group in Costa Rica tell me, 
they feel weaker as a people for not having Jaguars living with them. Yeah, I think culturally people really want to live with Jaguars and as far as an intact ecosystem, when they're gone, it just doesn't function as well. And uh, it's sad when you're around communities that have a cultural connection to the Jaguar and all of a sudden it's gone, even though they're part of the fact that it's gone. Um, then that's one thing we need to address in South America right now is uh, hunting jaguar for, I think, more of the spiritual trade in, in China. And they're just hunting them for their teeth, and we saw that quite a bit. And it's sad to see something that was gone now come back in many countries throughout South America. And it's, and it's very sad, and the people don't want it culturally, and if they're not benefiting from it, uh, uh, financially that they don't want it because they're the areas that they're living in the intact ecosystem is gone and there was a great study done not too long ago about uh, intact ecosystems having your top predator around because if you save the top predator in any ecosystem you can save everything underneath it that actually agricultural yields uh, of large agriculture or even small next to intact forests the yields were actually higher, and it was done by the International Forestry Council or something. Mm, and right. they couldn't say why, but it makes total sense. You know, if you have great insects and birds and, and predators, that uh, everything works better. Yeah, and if you would like to see more on the ground exploration throughout the Jaguars territory, um, you can follow along with Alan's journey throughout the Jaguars range at journeyofthejaguar.org. So I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, Ishan asks, how do we tackle the killing of jaguars for their traditional medicine? You've touched on this just a bit before. So. How do you tackle it? Uh, my thing with all this is it's the demand. If no one has hunted jaguar for a couple decades and all of a sudden somebody comes in and offers indigenous communities money for an item that, uh, is easily obtainable, even though it's going to take some work, they're going to go for it. So if the demand's not there, then you won't have that issue uh, because you would ask people and go, when did you start hunting jaguar? And they said a couple of years ago, because I was just down there in June and July uh, and there's something new. They've been doing it for about 18, 24 months. And so if the demand's not there, they're not going to hunt jack. You know, uh, they're calling them all cattle killers when they would show us skins. The skins are worthless. Nobody can take them out of the country. They may cut them up into bracelets or something, but jaguars are being killed for their four canines. Stop the demand and the killing can too. <laughs> well, what Steve says is exactly right, and we have evidence of this. Jaguars and other spotted cats, ocelots, margay, they almost went extinct. They almost went extinct in the 60s and early 70s due to the at then legal trade in spotted cat skins for the fashion industry. Yeah. What brought the Jaguar back were laws. Was it inter specifically in the 70s, an international convention signed by all the countries, uh, an international convention for, for, for trade in endangered species called CITES. That was a huge impetus once the countries stop making it legal, and once fashion designers stop using real cats, real furs, the, the trade went to almost zero in many places, and the cats came back. And they have been coming back because jaguars, unlike tigers and now lions, have not been in demand by traditional medicine. Now, it's very scary. Now they are coming back into demand, as Steve said, for their canines of all things, for their teeth, for the strength of the giant. Don't ask me why, because there, there is no rational why, nor is it irrational. It, it's, it's folk medicine. It's the thought that owning, wearing, consuming part of a powerful beast makes you powerful as well. We've got evidence of that in, in, in the Western world also. 
But this kind of thing goes way back, and it is now entering into the Jaguar world. Yeah, and it's really sad because, you know, I held the tooth of a Jaguar, and I only felt sadness, and it bummed me out. And these people are killing a Jaguar for its four teeth. It's extremely sad, but it's rampant right now. And uh, so we need to um, somehow stop the demand uh, in these countries and help save Jags. And people had no connection between the fact that they were losing a population because these towns and cities are where they're being sold. People don't get out into the jungle much. And you get into the jungle and you see the fact that people go, yeah, we don't have this animal anymore. And it was a very unfortunate and sad situation. So I think on that note, it's a good question to round out our discussion today. Um, this is asked by Kate, and I'll leave this open for um, open discussion. What does the successful future of Jaguar conservation look like? Well, also, I think this is one all of us ought to take. And, I, and I'll start it off because it's been Jaguar, the, the successful future or the future at all of Jaguars has been a lifelong mission for me and one that I lose sleep over constantly. Well, that and tigers. Um, but to me, the, the Jaguar has got a better shot at, at, at existing the way it should the way we would want it to, the way it has in a historical past than any of the other large cats possibly. Others have got a great shot too, snow leopards. And we're fighting a real rear end guard with species like tigers. With the jaguars, we're ahead of the eight ball. With the jaguars, if we can maintain this jaguar corridor, this contiguous genetic unit of jaguars from Mexico to Argent, northern Argentina, with the possibilities in the future of jaguars maybe expanding into the United States, and jaguars even expanding south of northern Argentina, further into mid-Argentina, where they once also ranged. These are all possibilities. We know where the best populations of jaguars are left. Most importantly, most of the local people and governments I've encountered throughout Latin America, want to save jaguars, want jaguars to be around. Now, they also want money and development, and, and that comes first. But if you can show them how balanced, how things can both work and balance, not, it's not one over another, then I think jaguars have the greatest opportunity to actually not only survive, but to have the hedge against what future climate change or maybe other environmental perturbations or other human developments could bring because then they'll have a fighting chance give cats a fighting chance and they'll win out every time but they can't be just back into a tiny corner we still have a chance for jaguars to live the way they have for thousands of years that's my idea of a successful future the only thing, you know, I, I was really saddened this summer when I saw areas that had been, had jaguars removed from the ecosystem and places where you do see that they're there. A perfect example is a ranch down in the Pantanal. And I was there one year when, when there had been hunting of jaguar and we hardly saw any other animals. And in one year, protection, uh, for the jaguar, the place looked like a zoo. And uh, we saw maned wolf, giant anteater, tapir. And when you see intact ecosystems and see how vibrant and real they are, it gives you such an appreciation. And with the jaguar as the top predator in that ecosystem, uh, everything changes. And you see this incredible sadness, not just from the local people, which are vitally important to me because I live and work with them, but when you see them actually hunting something that is culturally a spiritual, a great and spiritual importance to them, and then this sad, silent forest, boy, you can really see the difference. 
But I'll never forget that uh, ranch when uh, they stopped hunting and, and from one year to the next. And you can see how important uh, jaguars are. And it's just fantastic that they are thriving in certain parts and people are benefiting from living with jaguars. And also the one thing that I haven't heard here is I, I you know, saw the, the panthera ranch and the fact that there's buffalo in the herd. Jaguars don't like going into herds with buffalo. Tigers don't like coming up against a buffalo because they'll kick them, you know. So, and uh, Howard was telling you that they have donkeys in, in herds in Central America. So you got donkeys and buffalo. So there's ways to mitigate problems with uh, jaguars and cattle or, uh, you know, uh, other predators around the world. But it's great to see that they're doing so well right now and you can actually go to places to actually have an experience and see a jaguar and all the other animals. Mm -hmm. You, Allison, yeah. you're the future. <laughs> yes. What do you think? Uh, for me, I really hope, my hope is that jaguars are just so resilient and if we give them that kind of space and protection that they need to survive, um, if we support the entire ecosystem, have room for their wild prey, if we can empower local communities to yeah. embrace coexisting with jaguars and other predators, to see that there is a benefit, whether it's economic, for their own intrinsic value to nature, or for that prolonged coexistence and maintenance of that cultural icon. I think that's something that would be preserving nature and preserving a part of our own humanity. And for yeah. us to engage with local communities, that is key. That's the sustainable future of conservation, really. And mm -hmm. so seeing this Jaguar Corridor Initiative, um, watching Steve's work, Alan's work, it's been very inspiring to me because they're right in there and they're helping these communities. They're bringing a voice and bringing this message to you at home or you at work <laughs> or on lunch break. Um, so you can understand and see and um, appreciate this kind of work in this kind of world that we live in where we're not as disconnected from nature as yeah. it might feel at times. And so if we're able to make room for a predator, something that jaguars didn't really evolve hunting humans, but we as humans evolved, for example, with tigers and lions. And for us as humans to make room for something that used to predate upon us <laughs> is, I think, something that speaks to our own humanity too. Um, so at least for me, that's one of the driving forces behind the decisions that I make in my career in life, uh, moving through this field. Um, I suppose on that note, if there are any final thoughts that you would like to add? I'm good. Yeah. I just think that the Jaguar, after spending 26 years and 20 working with big cats, you know, I learned a lot of it from this guy, but I'll say that uh, Jaguars are one of the most unique they're this, uh, such a secretive cat, and they're extremely curious, like Alan was saying. But, you know, and, and they have a cultural, spiritual connection to a lot of the people that live with them. And once they are in any of these ecosystems, that ecosystem becomes much more alive and vibrant. In a way that a layman like that, I can't put a, I can't say exactly what it is, but I've been to an empty forest, and I learned that from Alan is empty forests that are quiet and silent except for a few birds and forests that are alive. The jaguars around, it's doing well, but there's problems. Let's stop, find answers to those problems, stop the demand, and then support the people that are saving them so you out there can actually see the jaguar for the future. Save the jaguar. See you, Mr. Well, I learned a lot from you. I learned a lot from you. Yeah. <laughs> so if you would like to continue following, you can visit panthera.org. Steve, you're also very active on Instagram. Posting yeah, you can go to uh, at, at